We've talked about extraordinary gentlemen. I want to introduce, again, an extraordinary person who is really responsible for making all of this happen. And please also give a round of applause to Robin Smith. Thanks, Max. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. As you can see, we have with us some very extraordinary individuals who have shared their successes with many through their extraordinary generosity. Not just money, but their time and attention focused on accelerating research to find cures for diseases that impact others. While each one of these individuals and many of you in the audience deserve recognition and thanks this evening, we need to highlight a very special individual to receive the 2016 Pontifical Key Philanthropy Award. An extraordinary individual whose generosity, vision, and philanthropy embodies humanitarianism. This individual continues to show a resounding commitment to improving the human condition by tackling issues and projects that are not straightforward and require innovative thinking. Sean's highest ambition is to ensure that all of the people have access to innovative, effective, and affordable health care. He is focused on eradicating malaria, curing allergies and diabetes, and now his greatest mission to cure cancer and improve the lives of so many sick people suffering around the world. The Parker Foundation's recent announcement of the creation of the Parker Institute for Cancer with a $250 million gift is an example of Mr. Parker's out-of-the-box thinking and leadership. The Parker Institute's 21st century model is designed to overcome some of the barriers in translational medicine research that have slowed progress. This stimulus is what the scientific community needs to find a cure for cancer. It brings together the top scientists, clinicians, cancer centers, and industry partners to lead an intelligent, coordinated cancer immunotherapy research effort that rapidly translate research through breakthroughs into better patient outcomes. This is in a unique collaborative and entrepreneurial approach to scientific discovery, cutting across multiple fields to work with the many stakeholders. The Institute will develop a scientific roadmap and organize the field's top research researchers into an all-star team. It will invest big, fast, and focused in a high-risk, high impact initiative and will initiate close linkages, linkages between basic and clinical research. This research infrastructure will establish the best in class patient recruitment and trial management as well as manage the intellectual property. The Parker Institute builds on Mr. Parker's major philanthropic support which will help to reinvigorate the world of charitable giving <coughs> similar to what he has done with social media nearly a decade ago. He's transformed online social activism and philanthropy for the masses via Facebook Cures, which has enlisted 180 million people to donate funds and take action for social causes. Five years ago, Mr. Parker helped fund the establishment of Stand Up to Cancer and the Cancer Research Institute Immunotherapy Dream Team. In 2013, he was honored by CRI with the Oliver R. Grace Award for Distinguished Service in Advancing Cancer Research. Mr. Parker has publicly affirmed his commitment to give away the majority of his fortune in his lifetime. And in June 2015, he established the Parker Foundation with an initial gift of $600 million. As a father of two young children, he's an advocate of the moral imperative to give back and is personally deeply engaged in encouraging others to give, stating that he wants to create a model for other young philanthropists to follow. It is with great pleasure we award Sean Parker with the 2016 Pontifical Key Philanthropy Award. Cardinal Ravasi would like to say a few words. Prima di consegnare 
questo premio pontificio a Sean Parker, vorrei come sempre fare qualche considerazione con voi, anche perché questa è l'ultima volta che ci ascoltiamo, che parliamo insieme. E vorrei iniziare con quella parola con la quale ho cominciato il mio primo intervento la mattina di due giorni fa. Quella parola ebraica, Todà, al superlativo, se si vuole, Todà Rabbà, che è un ringraziamento grande, anche perché mi è stato rivolto da uno di voi, da uno dei relatori, che è di religione ebraica. Sono parecchi qui presenti di religione ebraica e che in questi giorni poi festeggiano Pesach, la Pasqua. E era il dottor Barzilai, che ha un bel nome, tra l'altro, nella tradizione biblica, una storia molto bella che dovreste andare a cercare nella Bibbia, una storia di rapporto con Davide. Ebbene, me l'ha ricordato questa parola e questa parola io la vorrei usare anche per concludere, cioè per ringraziare e lodare, come dicevo, due sono i significati, lodare e ammirare e ringraziare. Vorrei ringraziare prima di tutto proprio il gruppo molto più vasto di coloro che erano seduti poco fa qui a questo tavolo, cioè tutti i filantropi, tutti quelli che noi in italiano chiamiamo appunto i mecenati sulla base di questa figura di grande benefattore e amico di Augusto, imperatore. È una lista molto ricca. Io vorrei far emergere però tre nomi, se mi permettete. La prima, il primo nome necessario, e l'avete già riconosciuto, è lei, Robin Smith che è sempre stata vicina a noi fin dalle origini, che è legata a me anche da amicizia, che è stata di una generosità sempre straordinaria con noi e anche di un affetto, di una vicinanza umana. La seconda persona e la seconda fondazione, per ciò che voglio ricordare, è quella di Bossarge, che è stato anche lui vicino ripetutamente fino al punto di diventare parte della nostra stessa struttura, il, questo Ministero Vaticano della Cultura. E vorrei ricordare poi, infine, la nuovo, il nuovo ingresso quest'anno della Fondazione e della nella persona stessa di Danny Sanford, una fondazione di così grande rilievo che entra ormai anche in dialogo con noi e che ha questa sera detto anche delle dichiarazioni che sono particolarmente significative dal punto di vista umano. Avrei voluto commentarne una del signor Sanford, questa sul fatto che la filantropia può essere un investimento. E lo vorrei commentare, ma non so se il tempo è sufficiente, con una piccola parala, parabola araba. Così abbiamo anche il mondo dell'Islam, che pure è presente. C'è una parabola araba che dice un, pasto, un proprietario di cammelli, un cammelliere beduino, aveva undici cammelli. Un esercizio ora della mente anche, 
questa parabola. Undici cammelli e tre figli. Alla sua morte, sentendo la morte vicina, divide l'eredità dei cammelli nei tre figli. E secondo la legge beduina, al maggiore, al primogenito, tocca la metà. La metà di undici è un problema. Al secondo tocca un quarto. Un quarto di undici. È un po' arduo da fare. Al terzo tocca un sesto. Sempre un sesto di undici è un problema. I figli, il padre muore, i figli, come accade, cominciano a litigare violentemente tra di loro per dividersi i cammelli. Un altro cammelliere, amico del padre, passa e vede questi tre figli che si odiano per la divisione dell'eredità. E allora dice loro, io vi dono, vi regalo un altro cammello, in modo da fare il numero 12. Allora iniziamo la divisione, la divisione di questa eredità ormai di 12. Al primogenito tocca la metà. Quanto è la metà? Sei. Al secondo genito tocca un quarto di dodici. Quanto è un quarto di dodici? Tre. Sei, tre, nove. All'ultimo tocca un sesto di dodici. Quanto è un sesto di dodici? Due. Sei più tre più due fa undici. E allora il cammelliere che cosa fece? Riprese il suo cammello e se ne andò. <ride> per cui la gratuità, il dono, non necessariamente significa una perdita. Anzi, ma vorrei poi continuare nel mio ringraziamento, nella mia todà, rivolgendomi ai 50 e più relatori, a questo scrigno, a questo piccolo orizzonte di intelligenza, di impegno, e a loro in particolare, ma anche ai filantropi, dedicherò l'ultima mia considerazione. Poi vorrei ringraziare la mia Todà va ai moderatori, e qui ricordo per primo, perché anche lui è un amico da tanti anni, Max Gomez, che era presente anche ora. Sempre stato presente, sempre con noi, anche in passato. Poi Katie Kurik, Robin Roberts, con la sua testimonianza, entrambe con le loro testimonianze personali molto toccanti, e Sanjay Gupta. Ancora un'altra toda vorrei riservare a tutto lo staff che ha lavorato, che ha lavorato con grande professionalità, con grande passione, a tutto il personale e anche ai traduttori che io ho potuto ascoltare veramente con grande precisione, almeno per quanto riguarda l'ascolto mio della traduzione delle vostre parole in italiano. E da ultimo, se mi permettete, non è qui presente per cui posso farlo, vorrei ringraziare anche in maniera particolare il mio collaboratore, Thomas Strafni che vi ha seguito e che ora vi sta precedendo in uh, 
nei Musei Vaticani per preparare questo momento finale che sono certo non dimenticherete, anche se vedrete solo una piccola parte dei tesori che ci sono in quel piccolissimo spazio nel quale ci sono le figure più alte della cultura e dell'arte della storia dell'Occidente. Questa esperienza sarà un'esperienza anche abbastanza curiosa perché sotto le volte della Sistina ascolterete anche della musica. Ma non è la musica di Palestrina, non è la musica del Gregoriano, è una musica, devo dire, pur folk, folk tradizionale, ma eseguita da un membro della band degli U2. Io a questo punto, prima di consegnare il premio a Sean Parker, che sarà l'elemento conclusivo, vorrei però a lui, ai premiati dei giorni scorsi, a tutti coloro che non ho citato, a tutti coloro che ho citato anche questa sera, vorrei riservare appunto le ultime parole. Sono veramente anche le, forse le mie ultime parole con voi. Perché, lo posso dire a voi, nel realismo della vita, non ci potremo più vedere qui, probabilmente, perché le ragioni cronologiche, come ha ricordato ieri anche con grande simpatia, una persona molto simpatica, devo dire, Joe Biden, siamo coetanei e arriverà anche per me finalmente la pensione, la conclusione del mio mandato di Ministro della Cultura e sarà probabilmente l'anno prossimo. Per cui fa tre anni io spero che il mio successore sia qui e continui ancora questa tradizione che è iniziata nel 2011, proprio con Robby Smith. Io a tutti costoro, a partire proprio, dicevo, da Sean Parker, ma da tutti voi, io ho scoperto in voi, ho trovato in voi una carica che non è solo quella della scienza, del cervello, che è alto, certamente. Non ho trovato solo in voi, soprattutto negli ultimi, i filantropi, solo la potenza, la forza anche dell'economia, della finanza, che è importante quando si proietta verso ideali così alti. Ma ho trovato in voi soprattutto la passione, l'amore in ultima analisi. E questo è forse questa la componente necessaria da unire all'intelligenza e anche all'economia. Senza l'amore e la passione, intelligenza ed economia risultano fredde. E allora finisco con questo breve racconto che dedico a voi, a tutti voi, è il racconto di un, uno scrittore italiano, ateo, non credente. Si chiamava Ennio Flaiano. Aveva però una figlia che dalla nascita era stata colpita da una grave encefalopatia. Aveva forme anche epilettiche. Lui non era credente. Quando è morto, 
era amico di Fellini, ha lavorato ripetutamente come sceneggiatore dei film di Fellini. Quando è morto hanno trovato un suo testo. Era una specie di sceneggiatura, di progetto per un film o per un romanzo. Era sul ritorno di Cristo sulla Terra. Quando Cristo ritorna, evidentemente subito ha attorno una folla. Ed è una folla di chi? Di malati, di parenti di malati, che vogliono che guarisca. Secondo il Vangelo di Marco, metà della vita pubblica di Gesù è fatta solo di contatti con i malati, di guarigioni, di preoccupazione dei malati. Gesù fa perciò ancora, per compassione, fa miracoli. Ma li fa un po' non entusiasticamente, perché vedono, vede, che ormai c'è attorno la televisione, il cinema, i giornalisti, per cui diventa uno spettacolo. Ai suoi tempi questo non c'era. E lui desidererebbe fare qualcosa invece senza la pubblicità. Ed ecco allora che un giorno riesce a fuggire dai giornalisti, dalle televisioni, e va su una strada secondaria. Non c'è nessuno, per cui è felice, finalmente un po' da solo. Ma ecco che vede da lontano venire avanti un padre con una figlia che cammina tutta in maniera sgangherata, in maniera faticosa. È una figlia handicappata e avanza e Gesù allora capisce che deve fare ancora una volta un miracolo. Naturalmente voi capite l'elemento autobiografico, padre e figlia malata. Quando però il padre è di fronte e Gesù è pronto per guarirla, il padre gli dice, no maestro, no rabbì, non voglio che tu la guarisca. Io voglio solo che tu la ami. E allora Gesù risponde, in verità, in verità, ti di vi dico agli altri che intanto sono arrivati, in verità, in verità vi dico, quest'uomo mi ha chiesto veramente ciò che io voglio dare anche se non si guarisce, donando l'amore si dà moltissimo. Ed è per questo che io credo che se anche molti vostri pazienti non guariranno, come accadrà, anche se i filantropi non potranno aiutare tutte le sofferenze del mondo, però aver dato amore, passione, vicinanza sarà già aver fatto un vero e proprio miracolo. E ora premiamo Sean Parker. Grazie. Very Sean.
so I didn't have um, access to uh, one of the translation headsets, and I unfortunately don't speak Italian. Luckily, I had a friend um, back there translating, and I, um, I'm deeply grateful for everything you said um, and for, for all of your kind words. I understand a big part of it had, had to do with camels. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that, 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 that much I picked up on. Um, you understood. <laughs> um, so, so I just want to, um, you know, again, thank the Pontifical Council for Culture um, and STEM for Life Foundation for this incredible honor. Um, I'm deeply grateful uh, to Cardinal Rivasi and Dr. Smith for your kind words. You know, it's a, it's a huge privilege um, to receive this uh, award today in this incredibly sacred city at this conference, surrounded by some of the best minds in the world um, and many of the most generous hearts dedicated uh, to the pursuit of science that will, that will and is already uh, helping all of humankind. Um, you know, I'll veer off script for, for one moment, which is always risky. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> to say that, um, you know, several years ago, uh, when my friend uh, Laura Ziskin, who founded Stand Up to Cancer, uh, passed away uh, from breast cancer, um, you know, we we tried some early immunotherapies um, that were maybe a few years, a few years too early, and and maybe we. We got to Laura just a little bit too late. And, you know, I, I looked at this the way I look at most things as an entrepreneur who, you know, uh, inherently a very um, impatient person. Um, entrepreneurs are generally people who look at the world and they um, are not happy with the way things are. And they are motivated primarily when, when people, when, when venture capitalists, for instance, talk about vision, uh, uh, or when I'm looking at a young startup and I'm <clears throat> trying to evaluate whether the founders are going to be successful, um, I, I'm generally looking for this incredible strength of conviction, a belief uh, in the underlying thing that they're trying to do. So not necessarily their ability to go make a lot of money or not necessarily just the, <clears throat> you know, their, their capabilities. All of that's really important. But, but fundamentally, their strength of conviction in the idea, realizing that over time, you know, over time, you know, they're going to be tested. And the initial idea may not work out. Employees are going to come and go. Uh, Capital is going to dry up. There are going to be a whole series of problems. Um, and if they're not animated by this basic um, strength of conviction in their idea, then they're not, they're not necessarily going to make it the, the distance. Um, <clears throat> taking that same perspective to philanthropy, um, I, I, I felt like there, there were too many, too much short-termism, too little long-term thinking, too little of this incredible strength of conviction that, that is necessary to be an entrepreneur happening, um, you know, at, at, at large scale, um, you know, in the field uh, of immunotherapy specifically, but, but across all of life sciences. And I, I as an entrepreneur who is, who is inherently a very impatient person, I realized I had something in common with, with Laura and with all of the patients that I had <clears throat> interacted with over the years and all of their families, which, which is that, you know, you have limited resources and you have limited time. You have to make the most of it. Um, entrepreneurs are impatient people. The families of people faced with, um, faced with diseases uh, that are currently incurable, they are impatient people as well. And they need to be impatient because they do not have the luxury of unlimited time <clears throat> to figure things out. Um, and so it was with that sense of impatience, that restless sense that I had remembered uh, from, from when I was uh, a younger entrepreneur, um, 
you know, that I ultimately decided that it, you know, it, I couldn't wait. Um, just as the patients couldn't wait and their families couldn't wait, I also couldn't wait, uh, and I had to do something now, um, and I had to do it on a large scale, and I had to do it in a way that, that had a long-term sense of commitment associated with it. Um, so with, with that, I'll say that <clears throat> I'm honored to be in the presence um, of so many incredible scientists here and this incredible community of leaders, um, and I'm deeply proud uh, of all the work that everyone here is doing uh, to, co to combat not just cancer, but also all of the diseases that uh, we're assembled here and working on together. We often, oops, don't go yet, one second. We often, she she was back there. Is she still back there? I was hoping to bring Alexandra up here for a minute. As they say, there's always a great woman behind a great man, and, and she's beautiful, she's smart, and has compassion for others, and it's really important that we applaud her as well. And I'd, I'd like to see if she come up here and, oh and yeah. Picture. Just trying to embarrass you as much as possible. Perfect. I'll be <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, welcome. Oh, it's 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 actually my wife's birthday today. Aww. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. You're welcome. Congratulations, both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cardinal Ravasi. Want to sit up here? You can go. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Stay, stay for us with us. That's great. So the Stem for Life Foundation and its trustees, Steve Martin and Dr. Max Gomez, the Pontifical Council for Culture and STOQ Foundation, want to thank you for being with us over these past few days. We're so honored by His Holiness Pope Francis, Vice President Biden, The Edge, Gary Hall, Robin Roberts, Katie Couric, and Sanjay Gupta. We thank our many speakers, as well as the, our um, moderators, uh, Ted Tentoff, Henry Anhalt, and Stephen Groft, each of whom made the third International Conference of the Progress of Regenerative Medicine and its impact on culture a huge success. You have my profound gratitude for all of the time and generous insights. A special thank you to our steering committee members listed on page 34 to 46 of your program who have helped us put this wonderful group together as well as Gerald Cousins for all his editorial guidance and support for our many initiatives, including the book, Cells Without Borders, which will be released by the end of the summer. We also appreciate Allison Partners assisting in bringing our message of hope throughout the world. In particular, we'd like to call out Todd Adelot, who has worked so, close me, so closely with me since the first conference and has been a catalyst for our success. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the generous support of the Bosarge Family Foundation, Sanford Health, the Sean Parker Foundation, the Catholic Association Foundation, RSJ, the Guthy Jackson Foundation, Karen and David Haug, Athos Two Holdings, Aspire Capital, Foundation Medicine, David Rich White, Provectus Biopharmaceuticals, IBM Watson, Gojo, which makes Purell, Hackensack University Health Networks, Piper Jaffrey, Pfizer Oncology, GlaxoSmithKline, Mesoblast Limited, Organonova, Aegis Capital, the Norman Gordon Smith Foundation, AGTC, SETI Economics, Stern Aegis Ventures, MD Anderson Cancer Center, John and Mary John Papa John, Foundation International D'Amato, the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, the Maxim Group, the Susan Scott Foundation, Selective Benefits Group, Amarantis, Aura Rings, Grace Coffee, the Skinny Pasta from Gabriella's Kitchen. Additionally, we all wouldn't have had such a great time without Heather Bander, our project manager, Vision Matrix, 
the support of Altor Destination Management, Svetlana Danov, and Anna Kurdziel. It's also been wonderful to drink Grace's coffee and enjoy skinny pasta from Gabriella's Kitchen. And thank you to Aura Ring for their generous donations of the rings for all of our attendees and for teaching us how much, so much about our sleep patterns and our health and what we can do to, to stay healthy. We also want to congratulate our 2016 award winner, Sanford Health, the recipient of the Pontifical Key Innovation Award, Patrick Soon Xiang for being recognized with the Pontifical Key Visionary Award, and Sean Parker for accepting the Pontifical Key Philanthropy Award. I'd also like to congratulate Dr. Ed Bosarge on his new appointment as the Pontifical Council Admonitor and Senior Advisor for Regenerative Medicine and Adult Stem Cells. And of course, we thank our wonderful patients and patient advocates who have put a human face on our global mission. We applaud you for your bravery and inspiration. I also want to personally thank Monsignor Trafney for his friendship support behind the scenes, working to keep all of us safe while navigating our way through this magnificent setting, sharing some of its wonders and showing us the most exquisite hospitality. We are in his debt. We also need to thank His Eminence Cardinal Ravasi for our wonderful partnership and his belief that a dialogue between science and faith is critical to reduce human suffering. He has shown us the importance of changing the mission to be positive and focus on what a person should do with encouragement, as opposed to focusing on what you should not do. This is a perspective that I hold close and try and apply to all parts of my life, both personally and in business. It's been an extraordinary privilege to work alongside the Vatican once again in our efforts to enlighten the world to the potential of cellular therapies to reduce human suffering on a global scale. And of course, none of the three international conferences would have been possible without the generous support of Ed Bosarge and the Bosarge Family Foundation. It's been Ed's longstanding passion to accelerate adult stem cell cures and get them to people in need. It has been an inspiration and a catalyst to all of our efforts. Leonardo da Vinci once said, I've been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. So where, are we, where do we go from here? I'm proud to say we ranked on Twitter yesterday. But how do we ensure that our voices, this incredible conversation we've had this week, keeps going? To echo beyond the walls and inspire the development of cellular cures. I hope you'll consider joining us and being part of our next initiative we've teamed up on with leading figures in television and in the media industry for an incredible initiative that everyone in this room can participate in. We're looking for sponsors, corporations, uh, hospitals, research institutions, patients. It's a grassroots movement built on looking, uh, it's a grass, grassroots movement Video, please. Hi, I'm Meredith Vieira. I'm excited about joining an important mission, and I'm here to ask for your help. The foundation has big goals to rapidly advance cell therapies and find cures and treatments for some of the most debilitating illnesses our families face today. Bringing together scientists, doctors, patients, educators, business leaders, and philanthropists, the Foundation is a global effort looking to educate the world about the latest treatments and life-saving therapies. Now is the time for cell therapy research, and we want you to join our mission. will be our stories, this will be our success together. And we will do this together through our goal of raising $100 million every year until our mission is accomplished. Our annual sellathon is the rallying point. Proceeds from our sellathon and all of the Foundation's efforts will flow year-round into some of the most promising clinical trials and cell therapy research. This fight is personal for all of us. Cancer and diabetes, spinal cord and brain injuries, MS, Crohn's and arthritis affect our families and millions of others around the world. We will lead the charge to cure diabetes. 
we will lead the fight to cure cancer. Our Cellathon, the next big step to continue our momentum and promote sustained outreach, can only be achieved with your involvement. Join our Cellathon. Help us make the next big leap forward in cell therapy research. We thank all of you, our partners and supporters, for your generous contributions. Your ongoing support is critical to help us achieve our mission and push the rapid advancement in cell therapies. This global television event will serve as a, as a tentpole for a multi-platform year-round campaign dedicated not only to increasing awareness, but to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to pour into cell therapy. And you can all be part of helping us where we to figure out exactly where we need to put the money. It's these kinds of collaborations, these kinds of meetings that really help pull all of us together to make these cures a reality. We're tremendously excited about this, and in any way that you want to be a part, we hope that you'll reach out, send an email, give us a call. You all know where to find me. In this jubilee year of mercy, the Holy Father calls on us to direct our attention towards acts of mercy and reminds us never to stop at the surface of things, especially when we have a person before us. We're called to look beyond, to focus on the heart, in order to see how much generosity everyone is capable of. We're all called to give comfort to every man and every woman of our time. We hope that everyone will get involved and be a part of the cell therapy revolution. Finally, I'd like to encourage you not just to, to support the Stem for Life Foundation, STOQ Foundation, but more importantly, the many researchers who are working on solutions to cell therapy to cure the diseases that affect many people around the world. We thank you for spending the three days with us and hope you will join us for the final cocktail reception, a quick tour on the way to the Sistine Chapel to end the time with the, the guitarist U2 giving a special performance and a choir from Ireland. This will start at eight o'clock, not nine o'clock, because the alarm in the Sistine Chapel goes off at exactly 945, <laughs> so we all need to be out. Um, I hope you travel safely home. There'll be guides downstairs that want to walk us through the gardens, the beautiful Vatican gardens, to a reception, and we'll end up in the Sistine Chapel, and then there'll be more food and drink outside for everyone to enjoy and end this great event. Thank you for all being with us. <laughs>